Hello, my name is Dr. Ved and I am the Research Imaging Specialist at Imaging Core Facilities at UT Dallas. And today we are going to discuss about what is uh, image processing automation using Fiji or ImageJ. In this module, we'll be mainly focusing upon why is it important to uh, learn image processing automation. Next, I'll be talking about a case study of what happened during my PhD, which made me realize that it is very important for somebody to do this. And lastly, we'll be discussing a few topics about what are the typical precautions that one should take while learning uh, or doing image automation process. So in, these are some of the reasons why I found it personally to be useful. Number one is publication. Everybody wants to publish a cover picture in a scientific journal. And where does this come from? By uh, making very good representative images. So if you are trying to develop a few good images, you would need to learn all of these things. Next is consistency. You would like the same procedure to be rep uh, reproducible despite of you being physically there or not. Uh, because conventionally, if you are doing the image processing by your own human effort, then you are having a lot of manual intervention which could lead to a situation where once you are gone from the lab or if somebody else wants to try the same experiment in some other part of the world, they should be able to do it with or without you. Next is uh, speed. So if you are having one or two images, it makes sense to do it manually. But when you have gigabytes of images which are uh, going to take you forever to analyze, it makes sense to have an automated computer program which can do all the analysis for you within a few seconds. And lastly, documentation part. Just like when you have you do an experiment, you write down the exact steps that you did, like how many washes did you do, what kind of buffer did you use, what kind of incubation did you do, those kinds of things. And same way, once you have acquired the image, the analysis also requires similar kind of analysis protocol. And when you are writing the protocol, what you can do is to follow the steps with least amount of manual, manual intervention and write down exactly what methods did you use to analyze the data. And that way, anybody else can reproduce the same analysis without you. That doesn't mean that you are not important. It just means that uh, we want to make it independent of the human effort that we are putting in because analysis can, if human, uh, like uh, manual analysis can vary from day to day and also depends on mood to mood. So it will um, bring in more variance in the data, uh, which is not needed. Here is an example of what, uh, why I found personally that image processing automation is very important. Uh, Sonali was one of my seniors in the lab who developed a DNA nano device, which can measure fluoride inside living cells. And this was the first report of measurements of chloride inside the lysosomes of a living cell. The image analysis protocol seems to be pretty simple, where you measure the intensities in the green channel and the red channel, take a ratio of that, and plot that, that, that as a function of the number of endosomes. And based upon the distributions, you can tell how much is the chloride concentration there. If a sim image is very clean and nice like this, then the analysis is very simple. But unfortunately, living systems are not that simple. And as you can see, here's an image. It's a coelomocyte or a single cell where there are individual endosomes which are labeled with the device. And if you try to draw a line profile here, and what you will see is that the intensities are not homogeneous. Uh, the background here is more compared to background here and the image also is noisy. The way she figured out uh, to analyze this image was to do a stringent background subtraction. How did she do that? She would, for example, take an endosome, draw four ellipses around it like this, measure the intensities in all of these, take an average. So this would be giving an average background intensity you have the original image intensity 
and from that you will subtract this one and hence you will be getting intensity of only this guy so and repeat that over hundreds of endosomes like these in both the channels and then doing triplicate for each experiment and if there are 10 experiments like that then it can take almost a year to do at all that analysis so you can imagine how much of hard work she put in to make that happen and that's why the <laughs> Uh, this is the outcome but of course there's a what I personally felt was a better way to do it but we'll talk about that eventually uh, what she always complained was that the intensity in the green channel was very weak and that's why the stringent background subtraction was very important because had the signal been very strong compared to background you won't need this kind of background subtraction uh, we further analyzed after publishing this paper that why were the signal so weak can we make it better and what we found out is that the original paper from which we, we, we took the dye, uh, they used a suboptimal microscope setting to acquire the images. So here the excitation spectra is shown here, the emission is here, and the blue shaded region is the excitation they used and the emission was collected here. And as you can see, this is a teeny mini amount of excitation that they are doing. So of course the signal will be very weak so what it means is that don't believe just the article whatever is published uh, you apply your common sense first of all when you are designing the experiment uh, even if the pi gives you a paper that doesn't mean that the paper is uh, true or is accurate you have to apply your own common sense that's the first le uh, first teaching that i learned from there so uh, in our next sec set of experiments what we did was to make sure that we use the right filter settings and Hence, we used a CFP filter instead of the GFP filter. And the moment we did that, we were not just able to move into living organisms now. We could image deeper inside the tissues and things like that. Uh, but, and hence, we were able to also increase the signal that is coming in. And hence, the signal to noise improved. That is one aspect. And any computer program or any an image analysis protocol is going to be dependent upon that kind of data that you feed in. If you put in garbage, you'll be getting out garbage. If you put in good data, you'll be getting out good information. So it's something called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So I'm not saying that the images acquired previously were garbage. <laughs> These are great images, but they can be always better. Okay, like you see here. That is one area of uh, improvement. And another area of improvement is the image analysis protocol overall itself. So I am a hard working person, but I believe in working smart as well, where you come up with methods by which you can remove the human intervention as much as possible so that you can do use the same time for doing creative thinking and let the hard work be done by machines. Okay. So for example, this was the original image which was here. What we did was to remove the background adaptively using a background subtraction method. It's called rolling ball background subtraction method, which we'll be talking about eventually in our coming modules. Yeah. On top of that, if you apply also a bandpass filter, you can get rid of the noise as well. So this way, uh, I could write down a macro in image using which I could bring down the amount of time of hard manual labor of image analysis from 8 hours down to close to 15 minutes. And this 15 minutes was also mainly for required for opening the images, copying the data and everything. Uh, actual analysis would take about maybe less than a minute. Okay, So that is how much of speed up we could, we could do. Uh, by following these methods. Now, image processing is great, but there could be some caveats as well. For example, digital image zoom can only stretch the existing pixels. So here you can see that this was the original image. If you keep zooming in, you are not producing any new information. Which means is that if you want a high resolution image of tiny particles here, make sure that you have acquired image at a higher resolution if you have acquired a lower resolution it is not going to give you any new information 
next is uh, brightness and contrast so for example uh, this is the our favorite software visual image and this is the image that I used for analysis so I will draw a quickly a line profile here like this and I will press a button K which will give me the intensity profile here okay now what I will do is to change the brightness and contrast okay uh, this is the image and I will change the brightness and contrast let's make it brighter okay and remove the background okay now it uh, looks like the image has changed a lot now let's draw the line profile again and what do you see is that they are identical what it means is that even if you change the display values here it doesn't change the pixel values in, in, in fact you can see uh, wherever I hold the cursor you can see the X and Y value here and the intensity values also so this way you, uh, it is very important to understand that whenever you are trying to compare two images make sure that the display values are set to a level which you want it to be and propagate all of these same settings to all the images that's first one and changing the brightness and contrast doesn't change the values okay so these two informations you have to keep in mind next is digital image processing cannot create new information so uh, if you have an image which is 16 bit so for example this image okay here you see this is a 16 bit image if I and this is a TIFF image TIF okay now if I convert this to RGB what will happen is that it will convert to R of 8 bit G of 8 bit and B of 8 bit and what is this bit so 1 bit image is having two levels of intensities black and white 2 to power 1 a 2 bit image will be having 2 to power 2 which will be 4 so black dark gray light gray and white and 2 to 3 2 to power 4 and so on a 16 bit image has got 65,000 levels hence 65,000 shades of gray on the other hand a RGB image will be having each of these three 8 bit images which is just 256 levels so that means you have lost a lot of information while converting from here to here and if you try to convert it back that converting back is not going to create the original information it will be just like this where you have some image and you are trying to stretch it in the uh, intensity mode okay so make sure that you always export as TIFF and do all the analysis in this mode only not in the RGB mode so with that we come to the end of module number one in module number two we'll be discussing about how to remove the background how to remove the noise and how to do particle quant quantification like image analysis and so, so on and so forth with, with that see you in the model number two